Thank you. I'd just like to point out that I got a degree at an agricultural university when this esteemed place was still a college. <laughs> <laughs> and I will point out that it looks like the audiovisual came from that era. I, ap I, I apologise for the quality of the screen, but uh, we'll have to work with what we've got. Okay. So I thought I would, uh, that not many people will remember Ray, um, but looking around there's a few people with the same colour here as me, so they probably do remember Ray. That's Ray Bryan. This address is in memory of him and his work, and so I just wanted to show you what he looks like. Um, I had one sort of really auspicious meeting with Ray, and that's when um, uh, the plant breeders at Grasslands had bred Tahora white clover, which was specifically bred, so we were told, by the breeders to survive in low fertility uh, hill country. And um, I was a district agricultural scientist with MAF at the time in Taranaki, and Taranaki has some eastern uh, hill country, uh, quite tiger country, it looks a bit like that, and so uh, we were going to do one of, a, of a, the national series of evaluations of, white, of Tahora white clover in uh, the environment for which it was originally selected. And so, uh, Ray was quite, um, he didn't like too many math scientists, Ray, there was a bit of a math DSIR um, uh, competition in those days, and, um, but he did like my boss, Norm Thompson, who was the manager of the Taranaki Research Station, so I got to go down to this uh, auspicious meeting with all these scientists who I didn't know, um, and um, they were, the, Ray was there chairing the meeting and they were talking just before the, the real stuff got going, and, uh, another math scientist, an animal scientist in this case, Dr. Carl Yargish, his name came up. And I said, oh, he's dead. To which Ray looked horrified and he said, well, when was, did this happen? And, and I said, well, um, two days ago Norm Thompson had told me that he'd had a heart attack and in my naivety I associated heart attack with death. <laughs> luckily, it, uh, luckily it doesn't always happen that way. <laughs> And so uh, that was my claim to fame. He ran out of the meeting, rang up and found out that he was alive, came back and we carried on with the evaluation. <laughs> so, uh, okay, so let's get started. So the title of my uh, talk is that, Soil Fertility Finagling, a Curmudgeon's View. Now those of you who wanted to know what those words are probably went to Google. Uh, but here I'm going to define them for you. Finagling is the use of trickery or craftiness to achieve one's ends. And a curmudgeon is a crusty, ill-tempered, and usually old man. So, here's a couple of famous curmudgeons that you might recognise from uh, Sesame Street. And some unkind people have actually suggested that I'm like one of them, and that maybe that person is like the other one, or the other person, Jeff Morton. We are sort of soil fertility curmudgeons, if you like. Um, and just before I get into the talk proper, I'd like to just uh, give a disclaimer that the views expressed in this talk are my own and may not necessarily concur with those of my current employer. <laughs> that, that, gets, that absolves them of any risk. Okay. So I noticed uh, in the Countrywide that Terry Brosnahan, the editor, had put in an editor's note in March this year uh, under the title, More Giraffes Needed. Um, and um, he said that 15 years ago he'd done an expose, if you like, of um, people who uh, promised the world and delivered nothing and, and uh, took money from farmers' uh, uh, pockets. Uh, and, he's, uh, and he called them the snake oil merchants and he said that they don't deliver. And he wondered why scientists and industry people didn't, uh, talk, uh, didn't speak out uh, about all of this injustice. And so, um, Terry, uh, this is... Uh, this is my contribution to that call to arms. And just before I start, I'd like to quote Patrick Moynihan, uh, who said that everyone is entitled to their own opinion, not their own facts. So where I'm giving you some facts which have been published, etc., you'll see some reference, some authors' names and references there. And where there aren't, that could be my opinion that I'm expressing. Okay, first I'd like to start with regenerative agriculture which is a relatively new term that's uh, arisen, uh, which sort of suggests to me that perhaps what we're practising is degenerative agriculture, which kind of offends me a little bit. Um, and lo and behold, there's actually an, organi an international organisation called Regeneration International. And um, they say that regenerative agriculture is defined as uh, 
agriculture which is practiced to basically build the soil, protect the environment, uh, produce high quality, nutrient dense food uh, and uh, without degrading the land and essentially uh, leading to productive uh, farms, a healthy community and, uh, and econ economies. Which is, I think, a sentiment that we all probably uh, ad ad uh, adhere to. We all want to see that. There's nothing wrong with that at all. But then we get people who climb on the bandwagon, like this gentleman here who probably doesn't live a million miles from here, uh, and the Ashburton Guardian being the, uh, obviously the highly placed uh, expert on regenerative agriculture, publishes these things. Uh, and basically this, this man's uh, thesis is that 40 years of uh, current agricultural practice is degrading our soils, making them compact, drought prone and, ke uh, and chemical reliant. Um, and uh, one of the most disruptive practices in modern agriculture is the use of soluble fertiliser, which kind of uh, uh, upsets me a bit. And he's, because he's using the term disruptive obviously in a negative sense, when I would say it's disruptive in a very positive sense. So, uh, that's uh, a little bit challenging to someone like me, who spent their life researching soil fertility to increase productivity, quality, uh, and um, productivity. So, another gentleman in the same uh, uh, paper uh, says years of cutting edge science has demonstrated that all ecosystems, including agricultural ones, are more productive and resilient when they are biodiverse and chemical free. Problems have been born in agriculture from unbalanced fertiliser programs, etc. It's funny how it all gets lumped onto uh, fertiliser programs and soils. He goes on to say that the optimum soil pH in New Ze uh, is uh, above 6.3 uh, and um, New Zealand soils, their pH has been slipping because of the NPK programs that have been put on them and the overuse of superphosphate and urea. And, um, and all the problems on animals and humans have resulted from that. Uh, and he even goes on to say that Mycobasma bovis was caused by uh, or, or this imbalance of fertiliser and soil pH. So, but I'd just like to take you back to that statement there about uh, you know, resilient agricultural systems being biodiverse and chemical free. It got me thinking about natural grasslands. Well, so therefore in their tenant, it must be that natural grasslands are regenerated soils and that they're gonna to lead to productive economies and healthy people and so on and so forth. But the natural grasslands we're talking about are felts, prairies, steppes, and savannas. And those natural grasslands are all characterised by being oligotrophic. It's a good big word, isn't it? What does it mean? Oligotrophic means essentially that it has low soil nutrient status. And I put it in brackets chemical because nutrients are chemical. After all, we're just a bag full of chemicals and a lot of water and a lot of space. Um, and so, um, you know, you cannot uh, uh, say that chemicals are necessarily bad. So the low soil nutrient status of those natural grasslands mean that they are very low biomass production and low quality biomass for most of the time. They're sporadically grazed by uh, wandering free range herbivores. There's a slow recycling of nutrients because there's not a lot of energy, not a lot of carbon in that system uh, that's cycling. Uh, it, has a, it does have a diverse soil microbiome. Natural systems tend to have a wide diversity of species, but not very many of each, and they're not very active. Because uh, they're all just sitting there, ticking over slowly, waiting for conditions to, to support uh, their lifestyle compared to their neighbours that they're competing with for uh, light, space, nutrients, and so on and so forth. Okay, but what our pastoral farmers need is sustainable and frequent harvesting of nutritious herbage species. And so farm grasslands are generally copiotrophic. Copio coming from the word copious, meaning obviously that they have a high nutrient status and they're characterised by high biomass production and high quality herbage usually, frequently grazed by farmed herbivores because that's the intention. There's a much more rapid recycling of nutrients through dung and urine return, dead herbage, etc., all turning over uh, in and on the soil. The soil microbiome 
is less diverse because it's adapted to the new situation, but it's much more active. Okay, now, unnatural or farm grasslands, we have a bit of an enigma. There's a, there's a bit of an enigma with the grass legume pastures because it's not a natural ecological association. You will not find you know, clover legumes and grasses and herbs growing together nicely uh, in the uh, natural ecosystem. Uh, it is a human construct, a very clever one and a good one, and it's been uh, useful for us, uh, but it's not a natural ecological association. And legumes will grow very well if there's no competition. They can grow pretty well in low fertility conditions, particularly low nitrogen fertility condition, uh, conditions, um, if there's no competition from associated plants. But we put the legume in with more aggressive uh, plant species which uh, compete against them. And so the clovers are competing for space, light and nutrients in our pasture systems. And so all of the soil fertility work that has been done with conventional agriculture has really been predicated on making sure that the legume component of the sward is getting enough nutrients uh, relative to the competition, uh, the competing plants uh, that it's growing in association with. And our farmers must juggle soil management to enhance what I call the soil triumvirate, and that is they need to understand what, their, uh, what the basic building blocks of their soils are, the sand, silt, clay, which actually imparts a lot of the physical characteristics, the, the good things and the bad things about their soils. They need to understand the strengths and weakness of their soils without necessarily understanding the science. They need to understand what they can and cannot do to those soils. And uh, not only do, does the um, uh, sand, silt and clay control a lot of the physical structure of the soils, but, it all, but the clay content in particular controls a lot of the chemistry of the soils in terms of the, the nutrient interactions. They need to build and maintain organic matter in their soils because the organic matter links to the sand, silt and clay, helps form um, structure of the soils, uh, aggregates, uh, makes the aggregate stable and so on and so forth, and is also a very important uh, energy source for everything that lives in the soil. And of course, with a good structure, with good organic matter content, wa water and air can move in and out of those soils. And lastly, the biological um, functioning of soils is highly important to conventional farmers as it is to any other farming uh, credo that you want to practice. So we know that they're there, we know that they do a lot of really good stuff, there's the odd pathogen thrown in as well, but uh, uh, it's, it's not that we never think about soil biology, it's just that soil biology, provided you do some other stuff, looks after itself pretty much. Okay. So farmers are bombarded with a plethora of fact and fallacy to help them manage all of this um, complex interactions in the soil. And so here's just something from uh, that Soil Science Journal called the Northern Advocate, which is a paper from Whangarei, uh, uh, which uh, 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 some claims that they, they made back in 2003, but it's, uh, you hear this time, there's a seat up here if you want to come sit. Uh, that uh, the high water solubility of pea and super causes problems. Water-soluble pea has a high incidence of chemical binding to soil aluminium, manganese and iron, so it becomes unavailable for immediate use. And the high acidity of superphosphate causes problems, uh, works against microbial activity uh, and compromises the creation of productive humus. So all those are pretty strong statements about what's wrong with super. Uh, super uh, has been the P, S and calcium fertiliser of choice for many, many years. There's now a much wider range of products which will uh, provide those nutrients along with others. Uh, and so a lot of um, my examples are all around um, the work that's been done uh, looking at uh, that type of product. But let's talk about some soil chemistry. Uh, I see uh, Dennis there, <laughs> this is out of, you're a co-author of this paper, and so if I've got this wrong, you can uh, feel free to tell me, mate. So uh, basically, um, this is showing you, if you like, the chemical uh, sort of, this is not the organic phosphorus cycle, this is the inorganic phosphorus cycle, and essentially, when we add a phosphorus source, and it, it could be superphosphate, it could be DAP, it could be reactive phosphate rock, it could be, uh, a manure of some kind, when we add a pea source, it eventually ends up in source, soil solution. Soil solution is the only place where plants can actually extract phosphorus and use it uh, in their growth and development. Um, 
And um, when we put a soluble fertiliser in, uh, the soil solution concentration for a very short time, it gets very high. But very rapidly, you get this um, adsorption of phosphorus onto the surface of clay colloids. Clay colloids and clay and organic matter colloids. Uh, and um, the bonds, uh, uh, the, so th those, those are P molecules floating around in soil solution which can be used by plants and or microbes uh, in the soil. Uh, very rapidly the P moves into surface absorbed forms on the soil colloids and it's uh, at various bonding strengths. So some even gets bound more strongly on the soil colloids. And, and in some soils more than others, but in all our soils, there is a small uh, movement of P into non-available plant, pool, uh, pool, uh, plant pools. So either they move into clay, uh, clay minerals like allophane and they can't come back out, or they precipitate uh, and uh, they therefore become non-water soluble. But thankfully, these, uh, these three pools are in what I call dynamic equilibrium, so that as a plant or a microbe or whatever uses a P molecule from soil solution, another P molecule is released from the soil. And so we're actually using the soil as a store of phosphorus to slow release, if you like, on demand by the plants growing in those soils. And we have to top it up uh, on a yearly basis or whatever once we've reached optimum soil P status. So it's not uh, true to say, it's true to say that they do get bound to soils and in some cases quite strong bonds, but then they're, they're not irre, irre, irretrievable, the, the P is not irretrievable, it releases back into soil solution. And so Sires and his colleagues along with Dennis uh, looked at a number of long-term trials from around the world including Winchmore, uh, which you'll hear a lot more about in a minute, and they said basically if you consider residual P, that is the P that, that was added in whatever source originally and then bound to the soil colloids that over time it gets re-released for plant use. If you uh, look at it over a long enough time period and include residual P, then the efficiency of P fertiliser use is around 80% or better. If you look at it at a single, like over a three month period, it won't be 80%, but over a long enough period and with the effect of residual P, it is over 80% efficient. And they also went on to say at Rothamsted, which has been the longest, the longest running trials in the world, over 160 years they've been going, and the treatments have been basically kept the same, that by uh, uh, maintaining the Olsen P status of the, the plots, by replacing the P that's been removed by the crops taken off, then uh, they, they've uh, uh, estimated that they'll get better than 95% efficiency of P use. So, and I mean, if uh, soluble fertilisers such as uh, superphosphate was so bad, uh, how could Winchmore keep going for 66 years? So this trial has been running at Winchmore for 66 years. This is the last 10 years of pasture production data that's just been released from AgriSearch. Uh, the coloured bars are all different rates and uh, types of fertiliser. The black bar is the control, uh, no fertiliser, but grazed irrigated pastures, grazed by sheep. Okay, so the point of this graph is that um, uh, basically uh, the pastures are still responding. Notice how they go up and down year by year, control, even though they've got irrigation there, that's the effect of season and climate on pasture production. That's the sort of variability farmers have to deal with from a year to year basis. Quite challenging. Okay, so, um, and you know, so the, so the claim is that soluble fertilisers are, are not sustainable, 66 years still producing, more than if you hadn't put fertiliser on at all, in the form of P, S and calcium. Uh, what about pH? You know, super's acid according to these people. Uh, and um, here's Winchmore, oops, sorry. Here's Winchmore uh, after 37 years, Long Nguyen uh, uh, looked at the soil pH. Uh, and um, basically, if you can see those figures, which you can't, you might just have to take my word for it, that they've slightly uh, decreased at all depths. Um, and they're significantly different um, at all depths, changed by about 0.2, 0.3 of a pH unit. And that's, uh, sorry, and the treatments are uh, no fertiliser versus 188 and 376 kilograms of superphosphate per hectare per year for 37 years in this case. 
Uh, and so that is not the superphosphate that's causing that. It is acidification of soils which happen in pastoral and cropping situations. And that is because uh, plants grow in soils, they fix carbon, photosynthesis, they take up cations and anions, and when they take up cations, they have to excrete cations because they have to stay electrically balanced. So they excrete hydrogen ions, organic hydrogen ions, they excrete into the soil when they take up cations. When they take up anions, they excrete bases into the soil, but they take up more cations than anions. And the net effect is they acidi the, the carbon fixation causes soil acidification. The better the pasture grows, the higher the rate of acidification. There's another process, nitrogen fixation. So every form of nitrogen eventually goes through nitrification because we have a lot of nitrifying bacteria in our soils, which is a good thing, not a bad thing, um, and um, basically converts whatever form the nitrogen uh, enters the soil in into first ammonia and then into nitrate. Ammonia um, ions, sorry, ammonium ions have four hydrogen ions, nitrate has none. Where do the hydrogen ions go? They end up in the soil. So um, nitrogen fixation and nitrification all acidify the soil. And then finally, some fertiliser products do acidify soils. Elemental sulphur, which we use in some uh, situations, acidifies the soil. Uh, urea and ammonia fertilisers all go through that nitrification cycle from urea to ammonia to uh, nitrate and so acidify the soil. And so we do have, if we don't use lime on our pastoral systems, over time our pH will go down. If we're using soluble fertilisers to increase productivity, we will increase the rate of acidification. But it's an indirect effect, not a direct effect. And after all, that's why we have lime. We either have capital lime to raise the pH to the optimum, not 6.3, but more like 6, uh, and, um, and we then use lime to uh, maintain that pH to neutralise the acidification on an annual basis or, or longer, depending on the choice of, of the farm. So, what about soil biology? Well, this is probably the last frontier. Well, um, uh, you know, th it's very complicated, uh, and while we know some things, we don't know a lot. And, um, you know, there's life in the soil, Jim, but not as we know it. If you're a tricky fan, you'll understand that uh, reference. And, you know, in, in uh, fertile topsoils, in about a teaspoon of soil, there's uh, around about a billion organisms. Most of them are bacteria and fungi, but there are some larger ones important for soil function as well. And, uh, you know, and so the finaglers will say that soluble fertilisers kill soil bacteria. And uh, as you saw, it's no good for soil microbes and doesn't allow the build-up of humus and so on and so forth. Well, so at Winchmore, uh, after 38 years of uh, those same fertiliser treatments, control 188, 376, every year for 38 years, um, Trish Fraser and colleagues went out and measured uh, microbial biomass, which is the weight of organisms per kilogram of soil, essentially. Um, and um, here we see that uh, the no fertiliser, the control farmlet, grazed by sheep, remember though, uh, so there's a bit of recycling of the grazed herbage and dung and urine, etc. And the two uh, uh, fertiliser treatments, the microbial biomass is greatest uh, with the two fertilised, grazed and irrigated treatments. Um, and notice that even the no fertiliser treatment but grazed, there's a seat down there mate. Oh, yeah. Thanks, um, uh, that the, uh, the, 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 even that's better than what I've classed there, the orange bar, as the wild area. Now, um, it's now been ploughed under, unfortunately, but uh, when they originally established uh, Winchmore, they left an area in the original, I think it was red fescue or whatever, the original uh, uh, herbage that was growing there, and so that's the microbial biomass of that area, less than grazed but unfertilised uh, farmlet. And look what happens when you start working the soil, uh, disrupting uh, the homes of the microorganisms, mineralising organic matter, unsurprisingly the microbial biomass goes down. And I reckon that that's where a lot of this regenerative agriculture and stuff comes from, continuous cropping systems uh, from overseas, you know, where you just pound the soil to hell, you lose organic matter, um, you know, uh, all your problems start um, uh, piling in on you. Okay. So, microbes thrive under grazed and fertilised pasture. 
Yep, ants but super and urea kills worms. And I've always said, if you drop a one ton bag of fertiliser on a worm, it will die. <laughs> but you know, way back in the 50s and 60s, uh, Peter Sears did an eight year trial in the Manawatu at Grasslands there, comparing grass, grass and clover, and super, grass, clover, super, and the grazing animal, and unsurprisingly showed an increase in pasture production. But the red line there is the increase in the weight of earthworms. And so he showed, quite conclusively, that grazed fertilised pasture will also grow more earthworms. And uh, uh, Nicole Sean, for her PhD, looked at some work that had been done by Lambert and others at um, Ballantrae Hill Country Research Station in the, uh, at the bottom of the Ruahine Ranges in the Manawatu. And in 1979, uh, about five years after the low fertiliser, high fertiliser farmlets were established at Ballantrae, uh, they uh, started to see a difference in earthworm numbers. And by 2000, and oh, I can't even read that, 2006, when she remeasured them, you know, there'd been a further increase, particularly in the high fertiliser grazed farmlets uh, with earthworm numbers. Why is that? Why do more bugs grow? Why do more earthworms grow when you fertilise and graze pastures? Anyone give me an answer? More yeah, just as you're providing more tucker for the animals that are grazing those, gra uh, grazing those pastures, you're providing a way more tucker for everything that lives in the soil. So, Farmers are also hit with a constant array of uh, claims for alternative approaches to soil fertility. For example, my product has 18 elements in it, therefore it's got to be much better than that superphosphate which only has three. Uh, I'll take perfectly soluble fertiliser, grind it up, charge you an arm and a leg and it'll grow you two to three times more partial than the equivalent uh, amount of the same nutrients. Fine particle application. There's a good one. Uh, <laughs> the base cation saturation ratio theory, also known as the Albrecht Kinsey approach. And have you got a sense of fumate? Because uh, uh, we'll talk about that. Okay, so, uh, at, uh, so this is the periodic table I got off Google. And uh, this one says we have uh, at least 110 elements known to humans, uh, of which some of the uh, Bigger atomic number ones have been man-made, but nevertheless, there's a lot of elements in the periodic table. But not all of them are required for plants and animals, for, for us and for everything that lives on this earth. Uh, in fact, um, uh, these are the major and the trace elements that are required for all life on earth. Now, the ones in green are supplied not purposely in fertiliser products, Carbon, hydrogen, oxygen comes from the air, comes from carbon dioxide, comes from water, but they also are, are constituents of the compounds that make up the fertiliser products that are sold to farmers. The ones in blue are ones that can be supplied uh, to a farmer to apply to his farm. And similarly with the trace elements, the ones in green, uh, we generally uh, rely on soil reserves, the, the elements that are naturally in the soil to provide the requirements of those nutrients but we know that in New Zealand there are uh, soils that are insufficient in terms of the one trace elements in blue, copper, cobalt, selenium, molybdenum and boron. And not all of those elements are required by animals and not all are required by plants. For example, uh, uh, sodium is not required by plants, uh, so the single aster asterisk nutrients are the ones uh, required by, oh, but is required by animals, sorry, sodium is. Uh, cobalt, selenium are required by animals but not by plants, but we apply them to the plants so that they get into the animals through their food. So it's not fair to say that conventional agriculture only worries about NPK, those top three there. We can supply any of those uh, nutrients to farmers in a cost-effective way. Not that I'm advertising, but so. <laughs> So all I'm trying to say is that uh, you know, it's not an NPK philosophy. How do we know what to supply? Well, we have a plethora of research which uh, looks at um, uh, soil, plant and animal testing which then tells us what is uh, required and uh, in uh, many instances how much of each thing is required. So we use soil, plant, animal testing to help us make the decisions as what's appropriate for an individual farming situation. 
Fine particle application. Now I showed this, I got this picture off the internet, um, and I showed this picture when I was talking to a group of, uh, they, were, they were young uh, farmers in the Taranaki Hill Country about three years ago. Uh, and they were the sons and daughters of some of the older farmers there who I knew when I worked in Taranaki. Um, and, but this guy was not the sons and daughters, he was the next generation up. And he said, because uh, I knew the family farmed in that area, I didn't know he was coming. But I wouldn't have mattered anyway because I wouldn't have realised what I'd done. He's sitting there saying, that's my bloody helicopter you've got up there, because he owns the helicopter business and he applies fine particle application fertiliser and I was rubbishing it. So he was not very, he's a big guy as well. <laughs> and uh, I'm happy to say that at the end of the evening we parted as friends. So <laughs> I calmed, well he actually his, his niece calmed him down, told him to shut up and sit down. That's why I said thanks. Okay, anyway, so, um, so fine particle application, they've kind of changed their story over the years and they're saying it's an application methodology, which it is. Um, and so they claim that because they grind it up and spread it finer over the surface of the ground that it's going to be more efficient in terms of nutrient uptake by the plants and that it'll, it'll uh, show itself by growing more pasture. They claim that you can increase your extra dry matter production by two to three times. Now, uh, they have to because it costs two to three times more than the equivalent solid nutrient in granular form. Uh, it improves soil condition, biologi biological activity and plant available nutrients, well so does conventional fertiliser. Uh, and pasture density and even growth are greatly improved and then they play the environment card, which is always important. Reduce leaching by 50%, not sure how they know that. Uh, reduce emissions by 14% and increase water use efficiency by 38%. So what evidence is there that FPA really works, apart from their own trials? Okay, so is fine particle application better than spreading conventional product? Well, um, the, the first guy that I remember, I was a district agriculture scientist, Taranaki, a, far, a local farmer got him, was in the, uh, got the guy to fly in and land on the car park of the Taranaki Agricultural Research Station with his helicopter because the farmer wanted to ask me whether I thought uh, what, the uh, what the helicopter operator was telling him was right. And what he was doing was adding three kilograms of N and P as DAP crushed into the weed spraying tank of his helicopter and spraying the hill country. Now back in the 80s, sheep and beef farmers were really doing it hard in terms of uh, economics. And so um, he had, this helicopter operator had pictures of swathes going up low fertility hill country where he'd sprayed on the three kilograms of P and three kilograms of N. And of course, uh, when you put N onto pastures, they always look a bit greener. And you could see the strip going right up the, uh, up the hillside. And so, and so uh, uh, that, became no, that product became known as DAP slurry. And a math scientist, Chris Corday, did some work uh, and compared DAP slurry uh, versus DAP solid at the same rate of N and P. Uh, and measured partial production, and you can see that um, there, was, there was a response versus the control, so it was a responsive site to NMP, uh, grew more pastures, but there was no difference between uh, the form of application. Uh, uh, people even grind up lime and say fine lime is way better than ag lime because it's finer, it'll work faster, and it does, no question because uh, it's a slow release product, surface area to volume ratio applies to the dissolution of limestone. But they do say that 250 kilograms of fine lime is the same as putting on 2,500 kilograms of ag lime. Well, it's 10 to 12 times the price. So you, they have to claim that you can use a hell of a lot less, otherwise it just doesn't make sense. But again, trial work suggests, so that's 200 and 400 kilograms of fine lime uh, versus 2,500 of ag lime. No way are you going to get the same pH change for the same duration of time. And then Paul Muir at uh, On Farm Research compared granular urea at 30 kilograms, fine particle uh, urea at 30 kilograms and 60 kilograms. No significant difference between the forms of application. And further to that, a, a review article has just been released, uh, just been published uh, in the Journal of Ag Research uh, by Morden Tillman and another guy, Morden, and basically their conclusions were that looking at all of the 
published work on fine particle versus conventional fertiliser shows that there's no evidence of any agronomic advantage to FPA versus conventional. And you know, the hypothesis is wrong because plants don't just have a single root below where the, the surface of the plant, uh, you know, where the uh, above surface part of the plant is, they don't just have a single root going down, they have a, basically a cone of roots, which inverted cone of roots which go down through the, surf, through the soil profile. A lot of the roots are uh, circling the plants. The, the roots of this plant and that plant are intersecting. So, so just because you put a gr granule in the middle doesn't mean to say that each of those plants is going to miss out. In fact, they're both going to have a chance of getting the nutrients. And things like nitrogen uh, um, diffuses across and through the soil by about through in, an, in a radius from the granule about 10 centimetres. Phosphorus doesn't move nearly as fast, it's only about a centimetre from the granule. But nevertheless, those roots intersecting under the ground mean they can access uh, the nutrients. So that's, what, that's my explanation as to why this, uh, this result has come through. Now I must stress that this is just on a straight comparison of the nutrients themselves because what fine particle people do also is often is put gibberellic acid in with the um, uh, FPA and of course we know that that adds uh, on top of the nutrients. So if you compare that with just plain granular fertiliser you're not comparing apples with apples. <coughs> the literature study, they did a literature study in this review looking at possible mechanisms for the potential difference between uh, FPA and granular and identified that only foliar uptake could be uh, you know, one way that FPA could be advantageous over granular. Well, and then there was nine trials which they compared liquid versus granular forms and found no agronomic difference, uh, 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 no advantage to the liquid form. And you know, liquid would be the ultimate FPA because the nutrients are fully dissolved in water. So, um, so uh, base cation saturation ratio theory um, says uh, that they fertilise to the soil's needs, whereas uh, the sufficiency approach, Liebig's law of the minimum, if you like, that every nutrient should be at the optimum uh, to avoid um, you know, uh, partial growth deficits or plant growth deficits. Uh, the BCSR says uh, the soil has to have an ideal ratio of cations. Uh, the balanced ratio, uh, calcium to magnesium to, potass to potassium, and if not, plant growth will be limiting. We say, uh, well, the conventional approach says that uh, levels of, there are levels of soil nutrients below which plants will respond if you, if you supply them. The ideal soil ratio was first mooted by Beer and his colleagues in the 40s uh, out of uh, New Jersey Experiment Station. And he, they claimed that the ideal ratio for calcium was 65%. So this is the base saturation. This is the percentage of calcium uh, that occupies the cation exchange capacity of the soil colloids. For those of you who've just been, or are still at university, or been teaching, being taught soil science, cation exchange capacity is a net negative charge on the soil surface. All right, and so all those positive things occupy, get attracted to the net negative charge. Calcium, they're saying that 65% of that net negative charge should be occupied by calcium, 10% by magnesium, 5% by potassium. Uh, we say that uh, there are levels of extractable soil cations below which plants will respond and uh, because we've calibrated plant growth to those uh, um, cation levels. Unfortunately, no one could really figure out uh, from Bear's papers how he came up or how they came up with that ideal ratio. And they actually even said in that paper that actually maximum growth will occur across a wide range of cation ratios. So that's a little bit head scratching. But about the same time, Dr. William Albrook, who is a highly renowned soil scientist in America, Missouri <coughs> University I believe, he, he kind of discovered calcium deficiency in arable crops as I understand it, and mainly because he was working in about the time America changed from calcium phosphate fertiliser manufacture, i.e. superphosphate manufacture, to DAP, MAP manufacture after the war, Second World War. And, um, and so he, was, uh, he, he realised, he proved that calcium was highly important for plant nutrition. He, he had done a lot of pot 
trials in glass houses, which he said showed that a balanced soil was uh, had a calcium base saturation of 60 to 75 percent, magnesium 10 to 20 percent, uh, potassium th 2 to 5, and sodium 0.5 to 5 percent, even though sodium is not required for plants. So that's what he said, uh, and he believed, and he was right, that calcium is an essential nutrient for plants, and it is for animals as well. Um, and that he said that it's the calcium which is important in plant function, but soil acidity does not play a part in plant growth. Well, we all know now that it does. And unfortunately, a lot of his trial work, his pot trial work, was compromised by pH change. So because he would use liming agents, which contain calcium and magnesium, to change the base saturation of calcium and magnesium, and also, by the way, if you have soils of variable charge, like we do, and possibly they do, do have some in America as well, when you lime a soil, you increase the pH, but you also increase the ne negative charge. And, and, and if you're adding a liming agent like calcium carbonate, what's the cation that's being added? It's calcium. So that's going to occupy uh, that increased um, net negative charge. So you can manipulate the base saturation of the cations uh, if you can change soil pH and increase the net negative charge which is what, what was going on in his pot trials. And his PhD student, McLean, said, thought, oh, well, I'll, I'll go and um, uh, uh, try this in the field, because pots is, is one thing, does it apply in the field? And unfortunately, he could find no effect of um, base cation saturation ratio in field trials. And he said, he concluded from his PhD that there was no ideal BCSR. You know, the claims that the system makes is that there is an ideal cation balance which increases plant growth and quality, which improves soil structure and improves soil biological activity. All of those things have been proven benefits of liming acid soils. So do you see the tie up here? There's, uh, it's more about soil acidity than it is about a perfect ratio of cations. Now, if magnesium was deficient, you'd have to add magnesium as well. I'm not saying that, and, but you know, we, we know about those things from the calibrations that we have. And a review in uh, 2007 basically said that a soil's chemical, physical, and biological fertility can be maintained across a wide range of cation ratios. Uh, and McLean himself said, well, the emphasis should be on making sure there's sufficient of every nutrient, of every cation, plus all the anions as well, rather than a non-existent uh, uh, base cation saturation ratio. But it has a lot of uptake around the world, mainly by um, people like uh, Neil Kinsey, who has a, uh, made a, uh, a worldwide career out of advising farmers on this very um, uh, system. Right, have you got a sense of humate? The claims that are made for humate are that one, oh, I can't bloody read it, uh, increases soil biological activity, yep, that's cool, uh, improves moisture retention, improves crop growth and quality, uh, breaks up compacted soils and makes healthier soils. All of which are what we would uh, attribute to having soil organic matter, to having good soil organic matter content of our soils. So, human, so soil organic matter is just recalcitrant dead plants and animals that are in the soil and, and being broken down by microbes over a, uh, different lengths of time. It is the food, it is the energy source for, for soil macro, micro, meso and microorganisms. So it's a highly important component of our soil. Humates that are sold to farmers are extracted from either brown coal, lignite, or other um, deposits similar to lignite called leonardite, etc. And so uh, the actual term humate is a human construct as well because basically what they do to make humate, they take lignite and uh, react it with potassium hydroxide. And the first fraction that comes out of, of that uh, reaction with potassium hydroxide they called humic acid. They then neutralise the, uh, the re residue with acid and the next fraction which comes out is fulvic acid. And the gooey black mess that's left that hasn't either dissolved in the hydroxide or the acid, they call human. So depending on the source of the organic matter, um, you, know, you can end up with very complex and complicated um, 
uh, forms of humate, fulvate, and human. So, uh, you know, they're various compositions, so there's no guarantee you know what's in them and how they're going to work. And humates are sold um, poten for potentially as food for you know, energising soil, ba uh, soil biology to get it really going because the conventional fertiliser has done such a poor job of killing them, etc. Um, and, um, and to condition the soil um, to make the soil structure better. And that, all of that would be true if you could add enough uh, to it, but I just want to point out that last column uh, on that table, which says that even in our semi-arid, what used to be called the brown grey soils of the central Otago uplands, there's 30 to 60 tonnes of organic matter per hectare uh, in pastoral soil to about that depth. And you go up to the beautiful vol volcanic soils of Taradaki and uh, other places of the North Island, just doing that to wind you up, um, uh, and you, you know, where organic matter binds to the allophane, you can get 175 to 300 tonnes of organic matter in a really fertile topsoil. So adding 20, 30, I don't know how many tonnes of kilograms of humates to those soils, I can't see is going to do anything at all for soil function. Interestingly, uh, in late June this year, Fonterra put out a little thing like this called Turning the Dirt on Carbon Farming. It was just explaining that in Australia, uh, the uh, government and farmers are looking at getting, uh, at trying to sequester carbon into soil as part of their effort uh, against cl uh, to combat climate change. And um, you know, it's, it's becoming touted as, as one of the things we can do to help climate change. Well, um, maybe. Uh, so there's just some cautions here, and, and farmers say to us, they say, we want, we want uh, organic matter or our carbon in our farms to be credited under the ETS, etc., which uh, is a fair call, but there's some real fish hooks in it. So this is what happens when you develop soils, basically. This was the organic matter content um, of some of the research stations way back in the day um, uh, um, measured over time. You can see that it takes quite a long time to accumulate soil organic matter. And then, depending on your soil, climate, land use, uh, basically it starts to plateau off, it equilibrates. Right? Now, if you want carbon to be counted as a farmer in the ETS, you would have to show year-on-year year increases in soil carbon. You know, just like a forest, if you plant a little pine tree and it grows every year, you're accumulating carbon until you cut it down. Uh, and so if you have soil carbon on an, uh, on, an agricult on a pastoral farm, it has to show, you have to prove that you can accumulate carbon year-on-year. Year. And uh, Louis Shipper, from Waikato University, uh, did a bit of work looking at the conversion from woody vegetation, uh, forest if you like, to long-term pasture, and it, his sort of increase there from uh, low to higher was about 14 tonnes, at his site, was about 14 tonnes of carbon per hectare. Um, and then, as I say, um, uh, you know, it starts to plateau off. And so here's, um, here's a sort of diagrammatic explanation of the carbon cycle. If you have a pasture system which is fixing 20 tonnes of carbon, um, uh, that sounds really great. But straight away in that year, um, the plants themselves have respired half of the carbon back into the atmosphere. That's because they have to survive. They ha so they photosynthesize and fix the carbon, then they respire it, so they're producing simple sugars, more complex carbohydrates, etc. They use the simple sugars themselves to stay alive for energy, etc. So those simple sugars, they fix this carbon, and then they respire back out as carbon dioxide. So, so only half of that carbon now is available for sequestering. And uh, five tonnes of that carbon is going to be decayed by soil microbial activity, uh, uneaten herbage, root turnover, etc. And that five tonnes of carbon goes back into the atmosphere as carbon dioxide. And of the 20 tonnes, uh, animals have removed about five tonnes. And so where does that go? Well, over half, 2.7 tonnes of the uh, carbon they've uh, consumed, they respire out uh, when they breathe as carbon dioxide. So we're down to 2.3 tonnes. Um, and so some goes off in product, about half a tonne, bits eructated out um, uh, as methane uh, uh, through rumen function, and that leaves about 1.5 tonnes of 
um, uh, dung to go uh, dung carbon to go back into the soil, of which some of that will again uh, be respired by soil microorganisms. So when you're at equilibrium, um, you know carbon in is essentially equating to carbon out. So you're just sitting, uh, spinning your wheels. If you went through a massive disruption, land use change, uh, you know cataclysmic climatic thing, I don't know, uh, then uh, you may well change that um, rate of accumulation or that equilibrium situation. And further to that, even if all of that uh, was handleable, Louis Shipper has found that uh, in the last three to four decades on intensively farmed flat land, that uh, soil carbon has declined. Uh, half a tonne, 0.3 of a tonne, and nearly three tonnes of carbon per hectare, uh, uh, per hectare per year on aliphatic, glay and peat soils. So, if you're a farmer and you had claimed uh, credits, carbon credits in the ETS, as you were building up carbon, and then you were shown to start losing carbon, you'll then be paying out. So, you know, be, farmers need to be a little bit careful what they wish for in this arena. Okay. Oh, but on stable hill slopes, uh, we're still in increasing carbon content by about half a tonne a year on sheep and beef farms in hill country. Last, last topic, I promise. So, are you converted to reverted? Now, so, what am I talking about? Reverted super or dicalcic super? So, we, so the fertiliser industry spends a lot of time, effort and uh, our shareholders' money taking uh, uh, tricalcium tri phosphate rocks and reacting them with sulfuric acid to make that uh, the, the phosphorus into monocalcium phosphate to be plant available, to, to be soluble, to enter the soil system, be stored on the soil and be plant available over the next months to years. And so if you then mix that with lime, either at 25-75 for reverted or 50-50 for dicalcic, and mix it up with a bit of water and let it react, what you're doing is reverting or causing some of that MCP, monocalcium phosphate, to go to dicalcium phosphate, which is less water soluble. Um, and so um, uh, some of the advantages of that is it's more slowly available. But as I showed to you, as I hopefully sort of briefly said to you, was that we're using the soil to hang on to the, the phosphorus uh, from soluble pea fertilizers. We don't need it sitting there in a less soluble form in in the soil. Um, and, but the people who sell it, and I must say that both Balance and ourselves sell reverted or dicalcic uh, uh, super, uh, but the people who really push it, uh, oh, sorry, say that um, you know, after seven grazing cycles, nearly 80% of the super applied is locked up and unavailable. Well, so that was my point of showing you the soil chemistry from size et al. That's not true. If you look at it over the right period of time, and take into account residual P. Water soluble P has a high incidence of chemical binding to aluminium, manganese and iron. Yes, it does. That's what we're using to hold the phosphorus for plant, available, for plant availability. So um, some trial work which I flogged out of one of Doug Emmeds' review articles um, shows that when you compare dicalcic super, that's the 50-50 mix of super and lime, it's reacted together, uh, compared with just a dry mix of lime and super at the same rates, equivalent rates, uh, there is no real difference in partial production. That was five trials, uh, average results. And here's an 18-year trial, which was run by MAF, um, uh, which Ed Meads, who was at this talk on Friday night that I gave up in the North Island, said, I started that trial, Ants, because I said Jeff Crouchley ran it and Jeff Morton wrote it up. And he said, yeah, he pinched the data off me and wrote it up. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, it's a sedimentary soil, pH responsive, low Olsen P, so you'd expect both lime and uh, superphosphate or phosphate to be uh, to work, but there is absolutely no difference in pasture production uh, depending on whether you use it as dicalcic or a dry blend of super and lime. So, why use it? Well, uh, on an equal weight of P, and S, etc. Reverted and dicalcic super grow the same amount of, of pasture as the equivalent rate of superphosphate. Uh, and lime, and the point is that lime and super dry blends cost less and give you the same response. If you want to put lime on, then just use a dry blend. However, these products were created for a purpose, 
back in the day. And that was when we used to sow fertiliser down the spout with seed. And so, it would, so reverted or dicastic super protects the seed from germination injury. If you have a seed lying up against a superphosphate granule as it's dissolving in a very thin molecular layer around that granule, um, you get a build-up of salts and acidity and it can burn the seed and uh, cause poor germination. But nowadays we have technology which separates fertiliser and seed and so on and so forth, so it's becoming less important. One just uh, piece of evidence from the west coast, South Island, high rainfall, uh, glade pods, old soils, uh, west coast, uh, uh, a late colleague of mine, Mike uh, Connor, did one of those uh, trials that was in the mean of five, and he said on the west coast ants, he said, the uh, dicalcic showed a slight advantage to super, and that's because um, it hosed down with rain for a week after we applied the trial, and you can expect some of the pea to be lost from the super in that situation. Okay, that's it. My final word. Ancient civilizations have collapsed because of the loss of soil fertility and soil erosion. And so it's important that we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater and make sure that we understand what our nutrients are required to drive our production systems. Nurturing the chemical, biological and physical condition of farmed pastoral soils uh, will enhance and maintain productivity and quality. Soil and soil processes will supply some of the required essential uh, nutrients, but will also be deficient in one or more of them. And we need to find out what they are, supply them, so that we can have productive systems. And I just make a plea, please, 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 get the basics right first, based on conventional science, to achieve and maintain optimum productivity for your system. And then after that, you can spend what's left of your disposable income on whatever you bloody like. <laughs> Thank you.